Welcome to our uh, webinar this lunchtime on the implications of COVID-19 on your audit and uh, financial reporting. Uh, for those uh, that don't know me, my name is Phil Clifflands. I'm uh, uh, the partner here at, at BDO. I head up our housing team um, and clearly with colleagues um, I'm now just uh, in some cases right in the middle or in other cases just about to start this year's uh, final audit season, and um, there's quite a lot to think about. So I'm joined today by a number of people on a panel, as you um, hopefully you can see the names on the side in front of you. So with me are our colleague Liz Kuzitsky, who is uh, an audit partner who I work very closely with here across the south of England, uh, joined by Hamid Gafour, who's a uh, partner who leads our team in the north, uh, uh, Paul Knight, um, who um, is uh, we're delighted to welcome back to the studio, actually, is a, a tax partner and leads for us in the sector on all tax matters. And finally, by uh, Rob Frost, who um, is a director in our technical standards group and leads uh, on all matters technical uh, for our housing portfolio of clients and is someone that is a core part of the team. Uh, we are going to spend uh, maybe 10 or 15 minutes or so um, just cantering through a summary of the potential financial reporting and audit implications of uh, COVID-19, and then really want to use the rest of the session uh, to pick up questions and answers um, and, and try and get to the nub of some of the key things that I know lots of us are talking about. Uh, we have had some questions in advance. and. Uh, so you may see those come up on the question and answer panel as we go through, but equally, please do um, ask your questions as we go through and we'll try and capture as many of them as we can. And I'm sure uh, when Rob comes on in just a moment, he may be able to direct you a bit more skillfully than me as to where you can ask your questions. Uh, before diving in, what I would say, however, is um, clearly uh, yeah, financial reporting and audit is important, but um, uh, in this fast moving, uh, and unusual circumstances, I would should really start to say, I hope you are all safe and well, and that uh, people are, um, I guess, getting at least uh, just as to what is our new normal at the moment, and something that I think we are all going to have to deal with for the period of time. And so, whilst we're talking through financial reporting and all the implications now, I suspect some of these things will, of course, run and run as we uh, go over the next few weeks and months. That's all I really want to say about introduction. I hope this is helpful. Uh, it is really uh, our attempt to bring together uh, a summary of the things that we've been thinking about, talking about, both with yourselves as clients in the sector, but also other interested stakeholders, such as the valuers, such as the lenders, and indeed the regulator. Um, and so we just wanted to try and bring them together at this point in time. And I'm going to hand over to Rob, who's going to take you through a few slides uh, at a high level, and then we'll go from there. Thanks. Um, I'm just going to make a start on the technical details. Phil uh, said we're doing this presentation primarily as Q and A for you guys. I suspect when I do uh, the 15 minutes or so of technical detail, uh, many of you will kind of come across some of these points already, either through conversations with your auditors, your audit teams, your peers, uh, your, your fellow FDs, or your board or some other presentations or seminars, but I think we really did want to give this as an opportunity for you to ask questions on maybe some of the specifics that you've got on some of the issues. Um, obviously, 15 minutes is nowhere near long enough to delve in too deeply into some of these topics. Perhaps there may be something that we raised that you may not have thought about previously and just give you a bit of food for thought as you enter into or progress through your uh, financial uh, reporting periods. So um, the first point that I will uh, talk about is um, going concern. I think it's a relatively high level um, and kind of overarching pervasive issue, uh, but one I think it's worth talking about uh, right up front, to be honest, and just being very clear um, on expectations. Points really made on the slide there that in an uncertain environment where your, your kind of business continuity plans have been activated, you're forecasting future cash flows. Um, you're normally used to doing that as part of your stress testing exercises. 
um, we have a, like a relatively um, high degree of confidence and certainty about what you can expect to happen over the next period. The situation that we find ourselves in is actually uh, always clearly uh, very different to the norm here. And what you might have actually constructed prior to uh, the coronavirus lockdown um, may need to be kind of substantially looked at and overhauled. And what we are saying as a, a firm, and I know the profession, the audit profession and accounting profession, and their advice on going concern are really focusing on is getting clients to think about those worst case scenarios. So almost trying to spend your uh, kind of expectations uh, about what might happen over the next 12 months because it's so uncertain, it's really difficult to nail anything on. Uh, but think about well, like where your breaking point is almost. What's the worst thing that could happen for you and your organization? And then think about, from a going concern point of view, if, what, if, if I know that worst case scenario, how likely do I think that worst case scenario is something that's going to play out for me over the next 12 months or for my organization? And that, I think, really does help with a kind of financial decision making. It helps give you some comfort, arguably, that, that perhaps you're not that close to being in a going concern uh, problem uh, situation. Or indeed, it may highlight some things that you hadn't thought about, which uh, you will need to resolve over the course of the next 12 months. Um, so that's kind of the first point I'd make is whether or not you had kind of concluded on your 30 year plan or whatever just before the 23rd of March, um, some of those things may need to be revisited even if that is just in the short term. I think the other thing to say uh, about going concern is about the implications for the audit report, um, actually, and the implications for your accounts. So it is expected, and I'll say more about that term in a second, but it's expected that many audit reports in the sector will have some sort of modification uh, in relation to going concern. Now, as I say expectation, I think I would kind of, uh, maybe would rephrase that, having moved some of our thinking on really, in sort of saying, it's more like that will be our presumption. So we are going to start, particularly from an audit point of view, and we would encourage you to do this as the, the kind of financial preparers for your organizations, to start from the point of view of, okay, there is a going concern problem here, and then look for um, the kind of evidence to support that and the information that you've got either to conclude, yeah, that's right, we do have a going concern problem, this is what we need to do, or indeed to convince yourself otherwise, to actually get yourself uh, kind of away from that presumption and to prove differently. So if you start with that assumption and kind of look at how you might move away from it, um, that actually does give you a stronger grounding for what you put in your accounts in relation to going concern and also then potentially means that we may not be in a position where we have to include a, such a modification in our audit report. But as I say, we're starting from that presumption, so don't be horrified uh, if your auditor kind of challenges you on the going concern conclusion that you might have reached, uh, even if you think it's, it's very clear cut for my organization that we're fine. Uh, be prepared for uh, the very open question of we, we are going to start from the premise that you're not convince me differently. Um, and that's something particularly we as a firm will be doing with all of our clients. Um, I'd also say at this point as well, not to forget about your group entities here, because um, a, a lot of your organizations understandably do think about your organizations as groups um, and very much as a, almost like a single um, kind of being, as it were, conducting its business uh, collectively. But you do still have uh, individual entities within your groups that each will have its own specific considerations from a going concern point of view. And it may well be that some of your group entities have more of a going concern uh, question or uncertainty than others, particularly if there are things like uh, cross guarantees, dependency on funding from other parts of the group. As a standalone entity, you may have some entities which themselves have material uncertainties which don't automatically translate across the group. So don't rule that out. Don't be, again, don't be horrified by that. I don't think it's anything uh, that's not expected to be relatively prevalent across a lot of accounts this year, to be honest, and not just in the housing sector. Um, I'd just say, just be prepared to have a kind of a conversation and engage on it. Thinking about some of the other financial reporting issues that are perhaps not, not quite as a per pervasive point as the going concern, um, things like the impact on uh, income, 
um, it, it's entirely feasible that rent arrears um, will become inevitable for some of our organisations. Um, I think the, the, the financial reporting implications there are, are kind of thinking about the impact on your rent arrears provisions, um, your budgeting, your forecasting for the current period may need to factor in some considerations about rent arrears and uh, the cash flow implications of that. Um, and also where you are doing any sort of exercise which might require a consideration of future cash flows, perhaps an impairment review, um, that sort of thing, maybe even a going concern review, of course, um, that sort of thing. Do just think about it, whilst it may be short term, are you going to see a bit of a dip in cash collections? And what's that going to do to your actual cash demand and cash need? And will you see any points through a period in which that, which that gets particularly tight? So uh, keep that in mind as you're preparing those accounts. Um, thinking about um, housing property that is actually uh, completed, um, the changes in the external environment that resulted from uh, COVID-19 um, could have an adverse impact on the environment in which the provider is operating, uh, expected cash flows from housing properties potentially triggering the need for an impairment review. I think as an organisation, um, you will need to give your own considerations which are specific to your own circumstances about whether or not an impairment review has been triggered or not. Um, I think, again, from a kind of advice point of view, I would start from the presumption that there is a trigger. And if you if you then genuinely don't consider there to be one, think very carefully about why you think that to be the case. Um, I don't think that the current situation necessarily automatically trigger, triggers an impairment review, but again, it's a it's a presumption that you would start from and kind of argue um, away from that. I think if it is considered an impairment review uh, impairment trigger, you would need to think about the assets that are affected, um, the ones that may potentially have seen a write down in value, um, and then determine what the recoverable um, amount would be. Um, and if write downs are required, again, that could have a number of knock on consequences, not just things like your going concern assessment, but also the impacts on the I and E, whether there are potential for covenant breaches. Um, whether there's issues on security valuations for the business and that sort of thing. So a number of issues which could fall from that. So that consideration of impairment triggers needs to be uh, a, a kind of a well thought through um, one. Um, housing property under construction, um, just think about the, the potential, particularly if you've got very significant construction uh, work that perhaps was ongoing, at uh, the, uh, the, the time of lockdown uh, where many construction sites were closing temporarily or and development pausing. Um, as, a, as a kind of a baseline point, obviously under FRS 102, uh, where development of a, uh, of a um, construction uh, ceases, you should stop capitalising any borrowing costs that might be associated with that. So where you have such a policy, you may need to stop doing so. Um, we do see, we have heard and seen a lot of questions about um, what that really means. So what if you are still developing, but it's just on a much more reduced scale. So you haven't actually ceased, but you're just doing it on a more limited basis. What about if you have ceased, but you've still got costs of security and that sort of thing? Uh, what about if you ceased for a couple of days whilst you tried to work it all out, but then you very quickly got back to some semblance of a development um, being carried out? Uh, could you continue to capitalise under those circumstances? Again, it does get a bit tricky there. I think it definitely does depend. Uh, the answer is uh, the standard talks a lot about extended period of closure. I think from our point of view, again, extended period would reflect any period really in which a decision had been taken to cease development uh, kind of in its entirety. Any uh, side costs that might go alongside that probably ought not to be capitalised um, either. But there will be some judgment in what extended means. There will certainly be some judgment in what is um, uh, kind of material. But to be honest, if you if you were to continue to capitalise, would that have a material effect on the accounts? And if not, does it really matter if you continue? Um, those sorts of questions will all be um, at play in here. Um, but. As I say, the, the base principle is that a cessation of development really does lead to a cessation in capitalising borrowing costs. Um, just to start cantering through, because we do want to get to the uh, the FAQs. I think a few questions um, will have come in. 
Um, there may be uh, various issues on uh, the housing market, obviously. So where you've got properties that are developed for sale, uh, you may have considerations to take into account in terms of the uh, expected realizable value of that. And uh, that, that might need uh, some consideration, again, as to whether you've got um, kind of write down issues um, and that sort of thing. Uh, we'll talk a bit about uh, the consequences on valuations uh, in, in a sec. Uh, we'll actually we'll jump onto that now in terms of investment properties, but not just investment properties. It will be any properties that you hold um, at a valuation. Um, we are seeing from a number of the property valuers, uh, as advised by uh, Rick's, uh, to be honest, that they are including in their valuation reports uh, caveats and uh, disclaimers almost about uh, the existence of uncertainty around the values they will have provided you with at the 31st of March. Um, those caveats are they're, they're quite standard. I don't think um, many valuers are saying that in, in a lot of cases there, that it really is a significant issue. Most valuers are saying we think we can still provide you with a value. Most valuers will still do so. Um, but they they will include in their report some comment about the fact they would have made a number of assumptions um, and obviously those assumptions and the ability of those to be what actually plays out is quite uncertain. In fact, kind of an unprecedented level of uncertainty in relation to some of those. Um, the issue that you will have is um, in terms of the principles of financial reporting, the, the extent of the uncertainty disclosed by your valuers probably needs to be reflected in your disclosure. So where you talk in your accounts about the assumptions used in your investment property values or indeed any other value, uh, assets that you hold at a valuation, where your uh, valuers do include this point, um, you will need to include that disclosure in your accounts as well to say that, that that valuation uncertainty, material uncertainty has been brought to your attention. Now, depending on the impact of that on your accounts, it is likely that we will include uh, a reference to that in our audit report. So um, where you make that disclosure, we will draw attention, uh, to draw users' attention to that disclosure in our uh, audit report. We will say um, that that disclosure of a material uncertainty given by the valuer is something which is useful information to users. And again, you may need to think about consequences there on covenants. Most covenants will say that uh, modified reports um, could be an issue at the date they are signed. Uh, so it's not expected to be a March 2020 covenant issue, uh, but perhaps a covenant issue for 2021, which you might want to discuss and agree with your audit or auditors and bankers. Uh, pensions valuations could be affected. I think the most important thing here really to say is um, the, the, the value of corporate bonds, which you use as a discount rate for pension liabilities, may have changed, and that may see an increase in the value of the relevant liabilities. But actually, what we're seeing in practice is this also has implications on the value of the plan assets as well. And kind of perversely, you might think what we're actually seeing is uh, a, a decline in the value of a pension liability as a consequence, because this seems to be having more of an impact on the asset side than the valuation side. Uh, but again, you might see some fluctuations on that and, and um, the extent to which that's important may need to be disclosed. Um, just a point on stock taking, I think it's kind of less of relevance really to the housing sector in terms of um, actually doing physical stock attendance um, from the auditor. Um, but we as auditors uh, are required by our auditing standards to attend stock counts where they are carried out. Um, if we're not able to do that, that does give rise to a modification in our audit report. Uh, it's a qualification actually. Um, and in some cases where that's necessary that we do attend, uh, we just may not be able to do so, which automatically gives rise to a qualification. It's kind of unfortunate, but that, that is just the, the reality of our standards and where some of these scenarios are ending up. But it's a less of an issue for housing because we inv invariably do not do uh, just a one-off stock count as at the 31st of March. So there may be other procedures we can perform in that respect. But again, it's worth uh, keeping in mind, particularly if you've got other things with uh, stock in it. Thinking, just thinking of derivatives, again, credit risk is potentially an issue with some of your 
uh, swap values, you may already be seeing some significant fluctuations in values notified to you, uh, but that's an issue that you might see come through. Um, one which has been flagged quite a lot for our audit work uh, over the last couple of months has been about your overall control environment. That's not necessarily to say that it has deteriorated, uh, but obviously at the 23rd of March, most of you probably moved from a situation of being very comfortable in an office-based environment, keeping on top of your control activities, uh, having moved to a very remote and uh, distant kind of setup may have uh, had some impact on your control environment and may have meant that you have, might have had to introduce new controls. You might have seen old controls that you couldn't possibly uh, actually implement because it needed some sort of physical presence. You may just find uh, your audit teams or auditors being a bit more challenging about how you dealt with that over particularly over the year end period given that it was actually quite close to the year end and where there are controls that we might have otherwise relied on for audit purposes but they changed or they stopped working actually around the year end that may need uh, lead to some sort of change in your or in your audit team's approach to some of the work it may go more substantive and we may have certain points that we might want to make about that in our reporting to the audit committee. Um, I think the last thing really just to say is about subsequent events. Obviously, there's a lot going on now, even post 20th of March. Things almost do feel like they're changing on a daily or weekly basis. More things will come to light, more issues, no doubt, will flesh out as we progress through an audit period. And where some of those things are significant, even if they don't affect your March 2020 numbers, they may warrant uh, additional disclosure as part of your post balance sheet events. Um, so that's kind of uh, really what I wanted to canter through. I realize it's a very, uh, relatively high level there in terms of um, the kind of the, the details and all of that. And you guys will no doubt have lots of issues that affect your organizations. So please, as I, as I kind of got to the end of that, think about the implications of that on you and just drop your questions in as you've got them. We have had a couple uh, kind of come through um, on this already. I'm just going to um, slide up and see. So Rob, it's Phil here. I think the first, oh, question, the first question we've got is around that, that point you talked through around the uh, material valuation uncertainty and, and the confirmation of what it means for the audit report. So. I think it's fair to say that we've had a number of conversations with some of the leading valuers in the sector, and uh, those conversations have been helpful in, in confirming, I think, that in almost all circumstances, the valuers believe they can give a value. So that, that's helpful because it means we move away from what I, I guess is a limitation of scope position into, a, into where we have a number, um, but it just has some uncertainty attached to it. And, that uncertainty may be so material that it's right for you as um, preparers of accounts to reflect that and, and therefore also right for us as auditors to reflect that in our opinion. But again, um, Rob, any thoughts, further thoughts on that? Yeah, I agree. I think it's a good point because the, the thing about the uh, um, suggested impacts on our audit report that I, I talked about before and that Phil just mentioned where we'd be drawing attention to, to disclosure about the uncertainty it, it technically speaking that doesn't amount to a qualification it's not a limitation in scope of our evidence it's just saying we've got the evidence we need to conclude on our audit but we think this information is really important to users so we draw our attention to it uh, this this sort of emphasis of matter does not represent a qualification of our audit report it is a modification in which there is a there is a difference, albeit a subtle one. Um, this is less of a uh, kind of a qualification of audit evidence point. So um, I think it's fair to say with this with this one that um, bankers, uh, our regulator as auditors, our audit regulators have tried to work quite closely with banks, uh, particularly around things like covenant compliance, so that banks understand what they're seeing when they see this sort of report that an emphasis on matter is not a qualification and shouldn't be read as such. Um, so there is an education going on with users of financial statements to, to get them to understand that where we have to include such a reference, it's not, it's not a qualification, it's not that serious, um, but it is uh, supposed to be helpful and informative to users. Um, 
So it, it shouldn't give rise to uh, covenant issues as far as we're aware, but we, we do know there are some covenants out there which do talk quite loose terms about modifications to reports, which might require um, some early conversations. Um, but yeah, I agree, Phil, that this is not a quite, this is not a limitation in the scope of our evidence. So a couple of follow-ups would be, uh, well, one for me, I think, is where we're finding that this is most likely to be impactful is, like, is in investment property portfolios, I think. It, it's probably the, the area of the balance sheet that is currently most materially held at value. I think that's probably what we're seeing. Um, uh, and I guess linked to that, a follow-up question is from um, uh, on, the, on the call is around if investment values can be estimated by in-house surveyors, uh, why can't we go through this approach uh, rather than through external values and does that mm. solve the problem? I don't know, if, Rob or Liz, if you've got any observations on that, if I could see you both. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I'm just a, I'll very quickly make the point, I suppose, we, we've had, actually had this question uh, across a lot of our clients internally. I think there's two things with this. I think, it, I think it's useful, to be honest. I, I don't disagree that it can be done by in-house surveyors. Um, and if what they kind of come up with is very much backed up by a third party valuation, which I would think you would still need to get, to be honest, I think that that is useful information. If you've got two giving the same answer, that's that's great. That's good evidence for us from our point of view. I'd find it difficult to see how both of those individuals, so the in-house valuer and the external one, uh, could not still be saying, yep, definitely, you can come up with a value, and we probably agree on what that value looks like at the moment, but there is still nevertheless uncertainty in the assumptions that we will we will be using because we just don't know how this will play out. And actually, if there was a difference of view there, if the internal surveyor said there's no uncertainty here, but the external one said there was, that's actually quite a more, that's a more difficult uh, position for us to reconcile, I'd argue. But Liz, uh, I mean, the thing I would add um, uh, is, I think the conversation we've had with the external values has been very much that the the, the probable or likely caveats they're putting in are, are essentially agreed through um, their conversations with Ricks and and and, and in line with the, what Rick the Ricks Red Book is telling them they should do in this current environment. So. Knowing that, it's, I think it's quite difficult for us to perhaps accept easily an internal valuation that, that, that isn't held on the same type of basis. Yeah. Good. Okay. Uh, okay. Having a look at the, the next question, we've got one on going concerns. So we're satisfied that our organisation is a going concern, but have been asked by our auditors to put detailed disclosure in the accounting policies. Um, comment being that we normally only do this if we thought, think there's a problem. So do we really have to do that? I think it's a really good question and one uh, which is, uh, you can imagine from an audit firm point of view is kind of well rehearsed with us over the last couple of months, to be honest. I think the, 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 the technical answer to that is the accounting framework requires that you consider whether a material uncertainty go about going concern exists and you disclose that fact uh, if it does. So I suppose, uh, kind of it, technically speaking, you could just kind of ignore that. I think the issue that we would have, though, and that this is where our regulator again comes into play, uh, got all the guidance from the financial reporting regulators are their expectation of like, real transparency about this. They're saying users of the financial statements very much need to be informed about your consideration of the impact of this on your organisations and what you think it means. So our regulators have put pressure on us as auditors to interpret that as being, we want real transparency about the disclosure, even if you think it's fine. And, uh, and to be honest, as a, from a, purely from a personal point of view, I kind of agree with that. If we think of the financial statements as being those things which it, uh, users use for making economic decisions, they want to be reassured that you've considered it and come to a well-reasoned conclusion on it. Um, where you don't acknowledge that you did think about it but concluded it was fine, a user may well think, well, you, you've kind of just ignored it or you haven't reflected your consideration of the issues in these accounts, so what am I missing? So I think on a, just purely from an information and transparency point of view, uh, we, we encourage um, kind of transparent disclosure. Again, Phil, Liz, I don't know, you've got more to add to that. 
Uh, I think perhaps the only thing I would add is that we're aware, I think I'm right in saying that, again, our regulator has, has launched a thematic review of the way the firms are dealing with going concern. So yeah. it is probably their primary area of focus. And so they are expecting us as auditors and, and also, to be fair, audit committees and, and preparatory accounts to really focus on the going concern principle and disclose to the users the, the judgments they're making. And, and so I think any accounts that are currently or thought to be silent on that subject would, would um, I don't think, be in line with the expectation of, of you know, either the FRC or, for that matter, the ICAW. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Liz, perhaps one for you um, around, um, uh, well, a second question around going concern with you is just picking up the point that Rob made around subs. And um, clearly, we know a lot of our clients have a number of subsidiary entities, many of which are set up for specific purposes and might be at a particular point in their life cycle. So, how does the going concern piece and, for example, letters of support play in with um, what we've just been talking about in the subsidiary context? Yeah, so um, I think what's clear is that we need to assess going concern on an entity by entity basis, um, looking specifically at the circumstances of that entity, and that's something that the directors are required to do under the Companies Act or other legislation. Um, where in the past a letter of support has been provided, all that provides is an intent to support the subsidiaries, and that's not sufficient um, on its own. What you can do is make sure that that intent is recorded in an illegal deed, which then enables you to um, take support from it because it commits the organisation to that support. Um, I think you need to consider carefully how you do that, particularly if it's a charitable entity that's providing that support, um, and to make sure that it is in the charity's um, best interest to provide that le that seed um, of support. The other thing to think about is whether um, it is really an issue in that set of subsidiary accounts, whether you do have an emphasis of matter around going concern, because those um, users of the accounts are primarily the rest of the group. And therefore, as long as there's no risk of cross breach of covenants because of a modification or an emphasis of matter in that respect, then um, it may be that you accept that there is that uncertainty for that subsidiary. Um, and kind of and move on. It doesn't necessarily filter up to group level, as Rob indicated earlier. Uh, Rob, anything, or indeed Hamid, is there anything you might want to add? I think all I'd add to that, so uh, uh, just to emphasise, I think, what Liz has said about emphases of matter and what I said earlier about the fact that these aren't qualifications. I think in the current environment, organisations, boards, banks, users, shouldn't be frightened of emphases of matter about going concern because the emphasis of matter basically acknowledges that the the organization has concluded it is a going concern but there is something very uncertain that kind of comes into play in terms of that assessment um, but it is a going concern and the evidence suggests that it's okay but there's uncertainty there and all our emphasis of matter really does is as i said before just draws attention to that disclosure so it, it's not questioning the going concern status. It's saying the going concern status uh, is assessed appropriately at that point in time, but but things could change. And, and I, I think in a lot of cases, particularly with some of the subs, which may not have like a very significant uh, like commercial role to play in a group, maybe it is a subsidiary where the, the activities of that sub might be the first to go very quickly if uh, an organization tries to look to cut costs and that sort of thing. Sometimes I do strongly feel like the right answer is just to, re to, to recognize that material uncertainty is there and to have that disclosure. But I appreciate that in terms of particularly recent experience, it, it emphasis a matter and the material uncertainties about going concern are something that people get nervous about, um, but, but agree with Liz for sure. Okay. Um... Moving on perhaps to another area of the balance sheet, actually, and, uh, away from the valuation point to some extent, although value clearly is part of this, is around the assessment of net realizable value for stock and work in progress. And if there's a risk of that being in, impaired, how should preparers account, I guess, what can they best do to evidence 
the work they've done to take, to take the view or judgment that they have and how would the accounting follow from there? Again, um, who wants to start? Shall I start? Okay. Thanks, Liz. <laughs> so obviously, when we look at net realisable value, there's two key components to think about. One is that um, the anticipated sales proceeds and what evidence there is to support the values that you have. Um, we know that there are still some reservations and exchanges happening despite lockdown, um, and obviously the market has opened up again. So there may be post balance sheet evidence of those values to support the pre the, the values that you had at the 31st of March. Um, equally, because there's a, not that many sales happening, there's probably a lack of contradictory evidence, which is also what we normally look at when we challenge the values that you've got. So the first thing to think about is those values, how certain you can be about them. The second area to think about is cost to complete for those schemes that are still under construction. And I think this is where we'll start to see a lot more judgment needing to be applied as we're already hearing that costs of materials and labour are increasing and therefore the ability to estimate what um, what those costs will be will also become challenging. So it's it's thinking back to what, what supporting documentation and evidence you have um, to support your estimates of both sales proceeds and costs. Having done that, if you think that there is an impairment, um, then that would be accounted for as uh, you're writing down the net realized, to net realizable value with the other side of that going through cost of sales in the I&E. Is there anything I've missed, Rob? Anything to add to that? No, very comprehensive. <laughs> okay, I know, I mean, I know, um, for example, I've got, a couple of clients who are approaching that by either a taking a bit of a macroeconomic look at, at the impact on on their assessment of NRV and uh, taking a for example a percentage write down from their originally appraised schemes based around their judgment of all the information that they've seen in a marketplace and I think that's that's not that's that's sensible in the sense that as long as we can see the evidence that underpins that and um, and equally, I've got other clients that have actually scripted value is to try and provide some some um, support to their assumptions on, on values of, of, of shared ownership, for example, um, as sort of one of the tools in their toolbox to, to, to provide evidence in, in a perhaps an expectation that the post-balance sheet numbers will be, post-balance sheet sales, I should say, are, are limited. So I think there are a number of ways of approaching it, and it's trying to get to a sensible evidence set that backs up the judgments people are making. Right. Um, just looking at the other questions that have come in. Uh, Before we move on, um, sorry, uh, uh, sorry, Rob, um, Paul Knight, um, who's here from the tax point of view, has just suggested he might have something to say on the tax tax consequences of um, property of the construction. So uh, perhaps, Paul, are you happy to chip in? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you can hear me okay, yeah? I can hear you, but I yeah. can't see you, so that's fine. You can't see me? Oh, no. <laughs> um, yeah, I, so the, the, the question that's come in is uh, is an accounting one around uh, whether you can capitalise interest costs where construction on new property stops and will be reintroduced um, later, potentially at reduced activity. I, I just cut in on that on tax, obviously not to address the accounting issue, but there is a really important point around um, what people do with their land in these difficult times where it's hard to forecast um, where you might end up on construction. Um, and, and the point to flag is if you change uh, tenure or you have a clear intention when you had started a build and that intention um, either becomes completely unclear, so you're not sure what you're going to do, or you change your mind entirely, that can trigger um, a taxable transaction even though you've not actually disposed of anything to a third party. So before you go ahead with documenting what you're going to do with property, it's well worth having a conversation around the tax um, so that at least you can manage the implication. As well as the corporate tax, there is a potential um, issue around stamp duty land tax, especially if you've been applying charities relief for acquisitions of land um, where your intention changes, that can trigger a clawback. Um, and that's quite a cliff edge 
um, point sometimes, depending on how you've accessed the relief. So even a small adjustment can have quite a big impact. So that should certainly be on the agenda to tick off. And then lastly, the VAT position as well. So recovery of VAT um, on costs related to development is uh, normally linked to intention and therefore if your intended use changes you could be in a position where you're um, having to revisit your VAT position so it is a complicated tax um, arena um, and certainly the way you deal with things like capitalizing or not capitalizing interest costs might be an indicator as to your future intent so it's best to look at the whole thing in the round Thanks, Paul. I think just to address the accounting question there, I think we did pick up on it a couple of uh, times in the short presentation at the beginning, but I think the the answer to this one, it, it really does depend, and I think it's one well worth engaging on uh, with your auditors or audit teams, because it, it kind of depends on what you mean by um, like reintroduced and a reduced activity. If If there is some development being carried out, then that I suppose in theory if that's an official decision and position that in theory does mean that you've kind of restarted development you've just kind of got different time scales uh, over which that will actually be completed so you just be looking at that period in which the development actually ceased if you mean reduced activity like nothing's actually happening on any of this but you'll have a security guard at the door or whatever or you'll beef up I don't know some of the the fencing around it to make it secure or something that that may not qualify and I think um, again it's one to discuss because um, ultimately will come down to uh, materiality as well and how significant the the effect of capitalizing or not capitalizing uh, will be I think just moving on to a couple of other questions there's a question about uh, furlough uh, assistance um, our housing group is taking advantage of a furlough scheme for certain employees uh, how do we account um, for the amount received? Is it netted against cost? Yeah, we didn't we didn't actually kind of really cover that in any detail in the short presentation, but it is a good question. I think the the main kind of principle again with this, it, it was worth saying there are not, these furlough schemes and other forms of government assistance. There are quite a few schemes that, that are in operation. There are a couple of very high profile ones like furlough and like some. Um, some government backed uh, loan arrangements and that sort of thing, but there are actually more than like 14, 15 different types of schemes that, that you that you could apply for or enter into. So again, it's a discussion with, with your professional advisors about the actual implications, but in terms of the furlough scheme directly, the, the basic principle is that you do account for them gross. So there is no netting off, you don't just show a 20% of your normal staff cost, you would have to show uh, a grant received for the, the amount that you've received and then the, the, the kind of the full cost of, of, of the, uh, the kind of employment, recognising that they are still employees. It, it's just not presented um, on a, a net basis. I think you um, important to note that you, you can't do that if you, um, if you haven't furloughed, of course. You can't just kind of assume that um, Kind of any sort of a, a assistance that you are looking to apply for, uh, you can just recognise without actually having uh, have had that agreed and, and received. Uh, but as a general principle on that would be uh, account for it gross. We have seen a few questions from some of our clients about um, about how we kind of present that net. Um, and likewise, we've had another question on the cash flow statement presentation on that as well, which is kind of the same principle. Uh, you show the cash flows from the arrangements uh, gross. So whatever it is that you've paid out in terms of staff costs and then whatever it is that you've actually received separately uh, in terms of grant funding and assistance. And don't there any other comments from panelists on that relatively straightforward, I think. No, nothing for me. Thanks, Rob. Okay. Um, okay. Go on. Uh, another area of questions. You had a couple of pensions and I think a number of our clients that have Perhaps in previous years, got pension valuations based on either December information or, or actually, I know in this case, some people have got February information, for example. Um, basically, do we really need to get this um, updated for the 31st of March or can we roll it forward? And I know, um, how would you love pension? So I was going to direct that 
um, in your direction. Thanks, Phil. Yeah, my, my clearly my area of expertise. Um, so um, I think I think I mean the situation clearly is um, unprecedented in what we're we're facing now, and I think the level of any sort of accuracy around the numbers, we can't around the numbers. To be, we need to be updated. You need to be updating, getting updated numbers for the end of March. Um, I just don't think that you know, from a, an organisational perspective, that you can you can be confident that anything roll forward from from December, you know, into into Feb or whatever is going to provide you with a level of accuracy that you, you require as a business in terms of understanding what your liability is and the potential impact. But also from an audit perspective, I, I think it would be incredibly challenging for us to be able to provide a, 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 a clean opinion on that. Clearly, I mean, that does mean that you need to be communicating with, with your actuaries and going back to your actuaries and making sure you're getting that, that right level of, of information. But I think the other piece around that also is I think you need to have, from an organisational perspective, again, have a closer look at your, your assumptions and making sure those, those assumptions at the end of March are, are as accurate as you, as you feel they are in terms of calculating that, that, that liability, particularly with regard, for example, where, where I think Rob touched upon this when he went through the went through the slides and mentioned pensions around the, the that we are seeing liabilities on uh, fall uh, with potential impacts due to lower salary rates and, and inflation rates as, uh, as well. Um, so taking it, I'd, I'd say again, taking them again the level of uncertainty that we have, that, that we should be, you should be looking to get updated evaluations at the end of March. Uh, thank you, Helen. I think, uh, Rob, you want to add to that? I mean, I think the thing I would add is that actually by updating the 31st of March, our experience certainly for this year is that is actually, as you alluded to in your intro, the, the, the net liability will be reducing quite significantly. Hmm. Agreed. Yeah, I, the only thing really just to add is probably just an emphasis really on what Hamid said about um, although these kind of roll forward scenarios are normal, it this isn't just it just isn't a normal year, and it's really difficult to see how even if a roll forward of from December to March does give you the right answer, you kind of need to get it at March to demonstrate that 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 is actually the case. So it, that getting that updated information is necessary, and I. And I um, kind of wholeheartedly agree with what Hamid said there. Okay. Um, I think that's all our questions, Phil. We've done a last call. I think that's I think everything that's come in, isn't it? So, unless so. anyone, ha maybe I'll, I'll pause for a minute and see if anyone can type anything ridiculously fast that uh, we wanted to, that people want us to pick up. But hopefully, I think that's counted through, I think, the key questions that we've got or had. And our, I think if they say still talking through in some cases as we, as we develop um, thinking, and, and perhaps that hopefully as some things calm down a little bit as we get to um, um, starting the accounts later in the summer. So, can't see any more questions coming through. Um, Only one of a, a practical nature feel about the slides being circulated yeah. or available to download. We can do that. I think for me, the, the value possibly was more in the questions, but we certainly can circulate well, slides and that'll have the contact information too. Possibly also rather than sharing the slides, though we can do, I think more valuable would be for people to go to the COVID hub on our website. So, because um, these slides are very much predicated on a, on a, I guess, a, a, a think piece that um, um, there's in particular led on, on some of the implications and you can see that on our website. Um, also on that website, you can see lots of other things which uh, may or may not be of interest to you. So. Yes, clearly we can find a way to share the slides, but I would definitely redirect people to the website in the first instance because there's, there's more information there that could be useful. And I think that is potentially just being shared on, on the chat function at the moment, the link. That's definitely the better answer. So, um, great. Okay. Uh, I think that is probably it for now. So, um, Five minutes, five minutes early. That's absolutely fine. I think it's um, um, always good to give people five minutes for uh, a biscuit or a cup of tea or something like that. So, um, really, I wanted to end our call by uh, thanking people for um, joining us and listening to us um, and talk about the interesting world of accounting and auditing. And hopefully, it has been useful. Clearly, if anyone has any follow-up questions that they want to talk through with any of us on the panel or indeed their own audit team. 
uh, please, by all means, do so. Uh, we will keep developing our thinking as this goes on, and if there are any material changes to the things we've talked about, I suspect we will get back on something like this again and, 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 and talk people through it. But uh, for now, thank you very much indeed. My thanks to our panellists, uh, who have chipped in, particular thanks to Rob, who has driven much of this conversation uh, with his phone attached to his left ear, which is always quite <laughs> difficult. Sure and, um, we shall leave it there, and hopefully people can enjoy the rest of their day. Many thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.